Anybody here ever heard of swearing Jack Waller? No? I see one. Well, I'll tell the rest of you a little bit about swearing Jack Waller. Swearing Jack Waller was a Baptist preacher. He lived in colonial times, but his real name was John Waller. They called him Swearing Jack before he became a preacher. It wasn't after he became a preacher. In fact, before he became a pastor, he was a lawyer. He was a lawyer who was known as a brawler, a drunk, and yes, a cursor. He lived in Virginia, and in Virginia, there was a state religion. It was the Anglican religion. And if you were a Baptist, you were not allowed to preach or to have assemblies. You had to be a part of the official state religion. Jack Waller, as an attorney, was charged with going and finding these Baptists and persecuting them and keeping them from preaching. Here's the problem. When Jack Waller went out and started listening to some of these Baptist preachers, he thought they had something to say. He started attending these Baptist meetings. He heard about a gospel filled with grace. He heard about a God that would forgive even his sins if he were to come unto Christ and be baptized. And that's what he did. He joined the Baptist church. And then he became the preacher. He began to preach, and he was arrested in 1768 for the first time. For you see, about every time these Baptists in colonial days would get out and preach, they would be arrested. In 1771, in Caroline County, Virginia, a sheriff and their posse, led by an Anglican minister, came in and got Jack Waller, and they pulled him out, and they took a bullwhip, and they stuck it in his mouth and said, quit preaching. They dragged him out of the assembly. They threw him down. They drug him through the street. They whipped him with a bullwhip and told him he was never to preach again. Jack Waller got up, dusted himself off, went back to the meeting, and finished his sermon. I'm pretty impressed with Jack Waller. See, though we have religious freedom today, It was not safe for Baptists in colonial days. If you were up in the northern part of the colonies, up in Massachusetts, you had the Puritans who were basically in charge of most things. And the Puritans held very strict religious laws. And you had to obey their laws. Baptists and Quakers and others of free churches were actually hung for not obeying these laws. This is why Roger Williams one of the first Baptists in America, came down to Rhode Island and established that colony as a place of religious freedom. And First Baptist Church, Providence, Rhode Island, the first Baptist church in America. In the southern colonies, it wasn't much better, for in the southern colonies, the Church of England, the Anglicans, were in charge. And as I told you, you could be arrested for preaching If you did not pay your tax to the church, you could be arrested for not paying those taxes. In the Revolution, there were many things that Americans had against the king. There were many grievances. The Declaration of Independence lists 27 grievances against the king. That's what we celebrate today. The Declaration of Independence that said, we will not stand for this anymore. Some of those included the right to naturalize foreigners. You see, in America, we needed immigrants. We needed folks to come and settle this land. And the king said, no, you cannot give citizenship. Uh, The king made the colonists keep standing armies. He required them to quarter them. Some of these soldiers even committed murders and had mock trials. Uh, The king cut off trade with the rest of the world. He denied the citizens fair trials. He dissolved legislatures. All of these things listed were good reasons for the revolution. But Baptists had even more. We had the grievance that we needed freedom of religion. Baptists, in fact, were very hesitant at first to join the revolution. They did not want to trade one heavy-handed king 
for another oppressive government. Baptists were afraid that there would be a national religion started and they would be persecuted even more. They wanted the government out of religion. You see, Baptists understood that freedom requires us all to be free. And religious freedom requires religious freedom for folks to be able to believe how they believe. During the Revolution, though Baptists did come on board, they did serve but all through the fight, they pushed for religious freedom. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison are best known for fighters of religious freedom. They oppose this persecution of religions because they are part of the Enlightenment. But it was Baptist, Baptist and others like us who got behind this idea of religious freedom. And they pushed Thomas Jefferson in Virginia to write a religious freedom document. And in 1779, Thomas Jefferson proclaimed this, no one shall be compelled to frequent or support any religious worship place or ministry whatsoever, nor shall they be forced, restrained, or molested in their body or goods, nor otherwise suffer on the account of their religious opinions or beliefs. But that all people should be free to profess by their argument to maintain their opinions and matters of religion, and that same shall in no wise diminish, enlarge, or affect their civil capacities. Jefferson said in Virginia long before we had religious freedom everywhere else that we needed freedom for all. You see, you may not know this, but the Constitution would never have been adopted without us Baptists. It was iffy. Uh, the British had surrendered October 19, 1781, but then the colonies had to form their own government. There was just a loose confederacy. And, and then as they began to talk about how can we join together and have this constitution, it took six years. And they fought over all kinds of things, whether they would have a strong federal government or there was an anti-federalist how much power the executive branch might have. How would we have representation in Congress? Would there be slavery? All these things were going around that Constitutional Convention. And who were out there talking about one other thing? It was the Baptist. They said, for this country to succeed, we must have freedom of faith, freedom of religion. In fact, Baptists at first, when the Constitution came out, many were opposed to it. They did not want a strong federal government because they were afraid of a national church. John Leland, who I hope you've heard about as a Baptist, was a Baptist minister in Virginia. He wrote letter after letter and sent petitions on to this constitutional convention. James Madison had to come back to Virginia to talk about this constitution. When he came back, he found out that John Leland was going to actually run against him for the Committee for Ratification. In other words, this document that Madison had actually helped write, he wasn't going to even be a part of it if Leland won. And so John Leland, that Baptist minister, and James Madison got together. They went out and they met in an orchard in Orchard County, Virginia. And they talked this thing out. And Leland said, I don't really want to run for office, but I insist that there be a Bill of Rights that has religious freedom. And Baptists pushed for the First Amendment and more. Madison said that if Leland would help the Baptists get behind the Constitution, he would guarantee that there would be an amendment right away for religious freedom. Y'all know what the amendment is, don't you? It's the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting or establishing religion, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or the press, or the right of the people peacefully to assemble, or to petition the government for redress of grievances. Baptists pushed for that. That freedom of faith in a free country. But they kept pushing. For even though there was a national bill of rights that established religious freedom, the states still could oppress. 
there were still state religions. The Danbury Baptist Association of Connecticut in 1808 wrote to then President Thomas Jefferson and they asked him to fight for religious freedom for all. Jefferson writes back to this association. He talks about a wall of separation between the government and religion. There was all this discussion. What is the place of government and what is the place of religion? Does that sound a lot like something that happened 2,000 years before? Way before we in America were struggling with this matter of religious freedom. Some folks came to Jesus in the scripture that we have this morning. Who were these folks? They were the Pharisees. You hear about the Pharisees all the time, right? They're all the time trying to trick Jesus. Did you hear the other group? The Herodians. We don't talk about the Herodians very much. They were the folks who followed Herod, and Herod was a part of the Roman government. In other words, you had folks that were part of the religion and folks that were part of the government come together to try to trick Jesus. <laughs> and they said, should we pay taxes to Caesar? Well, of course, Herodians were for that. The Pharisees were actually a little bit for it because they wanted the temple tax as well. They were kind of in cahoots together. But what they were really trying to do was trick Jesus. If Jesus says, no, don't pay those taxes, then Rome would come and arrest him. If Jesus says, yes, you must pay the taxes, then all the folks who were against this Roman oppression, most of the people that day, they would have rose up against Jesus. So it's a trap. Jesus recognized it. So he says, bring me a coin. He holds up the coin and he says, whose picture's on it? Of course, they say it's Caesar. And he says, well, give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are of God. Sounds simple, doesn't it? It's not that easy, however. We live in two kingdoms. We live in a free country and we celebrate today the birth of our country and freedom. But as we come to worship today, we also realize that we live in the kingdom of God, which is bigger than any country, bigger than any government. We celebrate that we have religious freedom in this country because it lets us live out our faith. Jesus says, keep your allegiances straight. Yes, there are things that in the world that you give to the government because the government is due them. But you always look beyond. You always look to what it is that God is having you to do. Baptists insisted on religious freedom for a number of reasons. First, because it is in the nature of God. It was a sovereign God that dared to create free beings. God did not want to create creatures that would be forced to worship God. I mean, don't you want to be loved freely? I bet you had an aunt. Let's just call her Aunt Mary. Everyone has one in the family. Aunt Mary comes in and she gets all the kids. She says, come give me a kiss. Y'all know the Aunt Mary? Come over here and give me a hug. Give me a kiss. And the kids are like, oh, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but they have to be forced over and they all kiss Aunt Mary because she forces them to. And do you think that's all that fulfilling to anybody? No. But maybe there is another aunt that comes in that the kids just naturally love and just run to and love because of the nature of the relationship. God does not want to force us into worship of any form or into loving God, but God wants us to realize how much God loves us Enough to give his only son to die upon a cross so that we might fall in love with God. In the Old Testament, God sent prophets to warn governments that they had to be free and they had to be just. In the New Testament, God sent his own son. Our Lord Jesus Christ has set us free. And scripture says that if the son sets you free, you are free indeed. 
Paul writes and talks about freedom and says, do not let your freedom be used for injustice, but rather live in your freedom as citizens of the kingdom of God. God, not the government, is a source of freedom. And God created us to be free that we might freely worship and love God. But Baptists also believe in religious freedom because of the nature of humanity. When God created, he didn't only create us free, God created us in God's own image. That's an amazing thing. You carry the very image of God within you. In every human, there is something of God. People are the crowning work of creation. Here's the thing. When we deny someone else their freedom, even if we think they are totally wrong, we, in some way, are disparaging that creation within them. If we disrespect others, we are disrespecting the image of God. I was always amazed at my father when I was growing up. My dad was kind to everyone. He was respectful of everyone. I saw dad sometimes when he was even disrespected, continue to calmly talk to folks in a respectful manner. I learned from his example that the way you treat people, no matter how you feel about them, is with respect. Not because we think they deserve it, but because they were created in the image of God and we treat others as God would have us treat them. When we do not see God's image in others, it allows us to dehumanize and then belittle them. People who are mistreated are always subjected to powers that say they are not a full worth. We need to be careful and realize that the nature of humanity is that all are created in the image of God. But Baptists also believe in religious freedom because of the nature of faith. For faith to be authentic, it must be free. It cannot be forced. Now, I just said some wonderful things about my father, and he was that way, but, you know, he wasn't perfect. He also had this way with us of sometimes forcing us to do things we might not want to do. Have y'all ever heard this from one of your parents? And maybe you or who parents have said it. You are going and you are going to have fun. I remember the most awful vacation I ever went on in my life. It was when my sisters, I have three older sisters, and they had all become teenagers. And they had decided they did not want to go on the family vacation anymore. And my father decided that we were going and we were going to have fun. Not only that, he traded in the station wagon that we always went in for a two-door coupe. And we all six had to squeeze in to the smallest car we had ever owned. <laughs> Dad said, we're going to be together. And on that vacation, we decided that we would go to Florida. And because we had so much fun in Florida, he brought us back to North Carolina to drive the parkway. As beautiful as a parkway is, sometimes I still have nightmares when I drive it. <laughs> and in the midst of all of the complaining, Dad kept saying, we are going to have fun. <laughs> we did not. <laughs> the nature of faith cannot be forced. And God does not force God's self upon others. And we cannot force our faith on anyone else. But there is another reason that Baptists want religious freedom. And that is that we know about the nature of power and governments. Power just seeks more power, and there need to be boundaries drawn around it. You don't believe it. Go down to the nursery. Pick a kid and tell them, here is a toy that you can have and play with for a little while, and then I want it back. What are the odds of getting that toy back without a fight? <laughs> Some kids may do it, but most will say, mine, mine. 
It's mine now. Why did Baptists way back when in the start of our country say that the church and the state must be kept apart? It's because we know that the government gets their hands upon the church. They will say it's mine and the church will be used by the state. Jesus lived a life of humility, of service. We've talked about these windows and all the examples of servanthood that Jesus teaches. And Jesus refused to start an earthly kingdom, but said, my kingdom is not of this world, but those who are living in this world will serve me, will be humble. We as Baptists know that to maintain freedom, we need to have freedom of religion, freedom for religion, and freedom from religion. Walter Short in his book, The Four Fragile Freedoms, which I'm going to be preaching out of the next several Sundays, talks about these different freedoms. Freedom of religion goes back to that First Amendment. It's the no establishment law that Congress shall make no law establishing a state religion. We do not have a state religion because we need freedom of religion. We need to be free to worship. We need to be free to come together. We know that the church does not need the government's help. We also have freedom for religion. That's the free exercise clause that the Congress cannot prohibit faith either. There is no sheriff. There is no police officer. There is no judge. There is no governor. There's no congressman. I don't care if the president of the United States walks in here and says, y'all stop this morning. They can't do it. Why? Because Baptists and other people said, we want a First Amendment. We want a freedom for religion. That means there's also freedom from religion. For us to be free to worship here this morning, we also must say others are free to follow their conscience. That great Baptist theologian E.Y. Mullen said in 1923, Baptists believe in religious freedom not only for themselves, but also for all people. While we may not have any sympathy with atheism or agnosticism or materialism, we still stand for the freedom of the atheist or agnostic or materialist in his or her religious or irreligious convictions. That is a strange thing. That is hard to understand. But for us to be free, we must let others be free. Why? Because Baptists understood years and years and years ago that faith does not need the help of any government. That what we need is a level playing field and the gospel will succeed. The gospel will win out. We do not need a crutch because the kingdom of God is powerful and it is coming whether we are ready for it or not. When you were a kid, did anybody ever say to you something like this? What, are you scared of a little competition? What were they saying? Well, they were pushing you a little bit, right? But businesses that succeed and do well, they are not scared of a little competition. They do not focus on the competition, rather they focus on their strengths. And when they become the best that they can be in their business, they succeed. We as Baptists believe that the gospel is such a powerful force that if we are free to worship, if we are free to share, even though there may be others out there saying other things, that the truth of the gospel will come shining through that is powerful. You perhaps remember the movie, We Are Marshall. You know, Marshall University in 1970 suffered a horrendous setback to their football program. A plane crash and 75 people were killed. 37 of those were players of the Thundering Herd football team. Five coaches were killed two athletic trainers, the athletic director, and 25 boosters that supported that team. They started just to cancel the football program. 
But folks came to the press and said, don't cancel it. Let us rebuild it. They hired Jack Lingle as the head coach. He had to rebuild that team from the ground up. It was hard to recruit players because the ones that might come knew that it was going to be a tough, tough season. And they kept going to other places like West Virginia. But that coach did not ask for any special favors. As they went to play from place to place, they would have memorial services for the team. And it got to be almost overwhelming to where the coach finally said, no more funerals. <laughs> no more talking about what is behind. We are who we are right now. And he believed in that team. And before their first victory, he made this speech to the team. He said, today I want to talk to you about our opponents. They are bigger, they are faster, they are stronger, they are more experienced. And on paper, they are just better than us. And they know that. But what I want to tell you is something that they don't know. They don't know your heart. But I do. I have seen it. And they went out and won their first game with that little team. The coach looked and believed in something more than all that seemed powerful. The coach believed in the heart of those players. Today, as we celebrate freedom in America, and I am so glad that we are free, we celebrate that our faith can come shining through that our church, known as First Baptist, has a heart for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if we live out of that gospel, and if we live out our faith, there is absolutely nothing that will ever stop the gospel of Christ.